Well, I'm going to say a prayer. Well, Father, I just uh, want to thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the time that you gave us to worship you in spirit and in truth. And uh, Father, I just ask you, God, just to help me as I uh, give what you laid in my heart to give. And uh, Father, I pray that you prepare us as we uh, get ready to have communion. And uh, thank you, Jesus, for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your saints. Thank you for our salvation. And uh, thank you, God, that we have a place that we could come and worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. <clears throat> well, I'm going to be in the book of Romans. And, and I'm going to share something that you heard me share before, but I'm kind of really intrigued by this part of Scripture, especially as we're uh, looking at preparing for communion. And I, I want to look at, because every time I look at this, I, I'm uh, just blessed by it. And, and I want us to get our hearts prepared and think about what Jesus did for us, you know? Um, you know, Jesus is the second Adam. That's what the Bible says. And you get the first Adam, you get the second Adam, and there's a big comparison between the two. And it's pretty amazing to me um, how Jesus came and did all of that. You know, like... The Old Testament, it starts with Adam. If you read the genealogy in chapter 5, you read the genealogy, and it starts with Adam. But right in the end of Malachi, the last verse, okay, it ends with the word curse. And in the New Testament, the book of Matthew, that's the beginning of the New Testament, it starts with Jesus in the, in the genealogy. Jesus is the first one mentioned. And right at the end in the book of Revelation, it ends it, there will be no more curse. You know, that's pretty amazing, the two contrasts like that. You know, and, and really... Um, and that's why I wanted to do this, so we could just think about, we could think about what Jesus did for us. And I want to look at it by contrast. And, you know, and I, I titled this, So Much More. Do you know that Jesus did so much more for us? He went above and beyond, didn't he? And, you know, and as we prepare our hearts for communion, we should think about that. You know, we should think about what that means for us. You know, the whole book of Romans chapter 5, you know, uh, the first 11 verses, it talks about what it means for us to be saved and how the blood of Jesus is really what justifies us, you know? It cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We can't earn our way. Jesus paid that price, you know? But after he talks about that, you know, like in, also in Romans 5, 8, it tells us while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, now that's pretty amazing uh, to even think about that. And uh, I get humbled every time I read that because I know that there's no way, there's absolutely no way any of us, okay, could ever earn our way to heaven, you know? And, and the thing is, it's really a blessing, you know, you know, like, oh, well, while we heard this before, we heard the gospel before, let's do something new. But you know what? We should never, ever, you know, think that that message is old for us, you know? Yeah, I mean, it should stay fresh and new in us every single day because if it wasn't for Jesus, we would be in so much trouble. Heaven would be empty. 
and we would all be condemned. Every single one of us, you know? And, and that's something to think about, that what Jesus did, that's a wonderful gift that he did. And the book of Romans kind of wraps it all up in Romans chapter 5. The first three verse, chapters of Romans, it says that everyone is guilty. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it talks about the religious man, the pagan man, even the moral man, okay? There's no way we could get to heaven. And those three chapters talk about that. And then in chapter 5, it kind of is, to me, that's like the highlight of the book, okay? When we look at Romans chapter 5, I really think that that's the peak of the gospel right there, is how Jesus came. You know, the moral man would have been guilty, the pagan man would be guilty, and so would, so would the religious man. Everyone's guilty. We all need Jesus. Every one of us, right? And, and, uh, and as we're going to communion, I want us to think about this contrast today. Because the truth be known, when Adam sinned in the garden... We were all there with him. When Jesus died on the cross, we were all there with him. You know, we were there in both those events. Some of us have never been at the cross because we never accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior. Right? But that cross is there for all of us. But we have to... We have to identify what he did on that cross for us, don't we? Every one of us. You know, I, I want to look at verse 12. I'm going to start there, and it says, therefore. And I kind of gave you a, an overview of what, why therefore is there. I, I kind of explained the first 11 verses. But it says, just as, just as though one man's sin entered into the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all sinned. How many of us know we all sinned? How many of us know we can't earn heaven? How many of us know, okay, that a pagan man can't earn heaven? It doesn't matter, you know? I mean, like, I went to Peru, and in Peru, those people, they practice animism, and that's like worshiping the tree and worshiping all these kinds of things. And, and what they do is they sacrifice animals and stuff because they don't want the gods to be mad. Okay? That's kind of what they do in Peru. The people out in the jungle. See, because deep down inside, even the people in Peru that never heard the gospel, they know that they have a sin problem. It's funny how we all know we have a sin problem. And, you know, it says, just as one man, sin entered into the world. You know who that's talking about? Adam. Right? And, and if you were to look from verse 12 all the way down to verse 21, that word one is mentioned 11 more times after that. Sometimes it's referring to Jesus, and sometimes it's referring to Adam. One, one, one. So there's a big comparison between the two. But see, sin entered into the world. And we know what happened, right? The Garden of Eden. You know, they ate from that tree. They ate from the tree and, uh, and they died. They spiritually died. Right? You know, so through Adam, sin entered into the whole world. Not just, not just Adam. You know, and we can even, we can even wonder, you know, like, why, because of what Adam did, why am I being punished? <laughs> you guys ever wonder that? But, you know, he's, he's our, well, he's our great, 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 many greats, father, grandfather, whatever he is. He's the father of all humanity. Him and Adam and Eve, right? And, and, you know, and when he fell from that tree, 
And even God told them not to touch that tree, but they did. They didn't listen. They got tempted, right? The truth be known, if, if it was us, we'd probably do the same thing. <laughs> we probably would have taken from the tree. We were probably given in to that temptation. You know, uh, it, but yet we inherited that sin from Adam, didn't we? We inherited that sin. It's kind of like this. You know, I, I want to kind of make it simple for us. If I had a match in my hand, okay, and I, I lit the match and I threw the match on the ground in the woods, all the woods catches on fire. You know, Adam's sin is like that match. And that match, all of us have been infected. And how do I know that? Well, in the Bible, it tells us, right? It tells us in the Bible that, that after Adam sinned, you know, God threw him out of the garden protect him from the tree of life. And he put an angel there, so they got cast out, put clothes on them. But the next chapter, this is how I know sin came into the world. The first murder happened. Cain killed Abel. A couple chapters later, it says that man's wickedness was so bad, okay, that God flooded the earth through Noah, okay? And he spared Noah. And, and not only that, but if you were to read Genesis chapter 5, everybody after Adam died. <laughs> so all those things are part of the curse of sin. You know, th that's all uh, consequences of sin. Even the animal kingdom died. Animals die now, too, because of the curse, right? The Bible tells us that all of, all of creation is groaning at his return. The book of Romans tells us that. So, you know, so when Adam fell and he sinned in, by eating that fruit he shouldn't have ate, him and Eve, you know, sin entered into the world. And we're still living in a world like that, aren't we? But Jesus came, and we're going to look at the difference now. You know, Jesus came. And I really like the comparison of the two. You know, so, through, so sin entered into the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all sin. Kind of like that match. You know, burning all the woods. You know, same thing. But until the law, sin was in the world. And, and you know, and that's referring to Moses right there. That's when the law was given. So the whole thing is the people before the law, you know, the law is what told us what sin is. It's like, that's what it is. You know, when we hear the Ten Commandments, we read the Bible, you know, the Ten Commandments. Now we know right from wrong, right? So that's what that's all about, to teach us what sin is. But, you know, the people before the law says until the law, okay? That means before Moses, <laughs> sin was in the world. So it was in the world even before Moses. And like I gave you some examples. Cain killed Abel, and the flood, and people died, animals died, right? And they had to work. It, the ground was cursed because of that, right? So, so nobody's off the hook. You know what I'm saying? Because we all inherited that sin from Adam, every one of us. That's what it says. See, but he wasn't going to hold it to our account if there's no law. That law is going to tell us that we are guilty. That's what it is. And we all broke the Ten Commandments, haven't we? 
So all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's what the Bible says. See, and in verse 14, it just kind of reiterates what I just said. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam till Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him that was to come. And, and I'll give you one more example. How do I know? How do I know we inherited the sin of Adam? Well, I think about, I think about little children. You know, they don't get taught how to sin. They just naturally sin, don't they? I, I remember one time there was a little kid. Uh, we were doing VBS up in, uh, uh, up in Newport. And... And this young man, okay, we had snacks in the kitchen, you know. And he was a young kid. And we had cookies baked for the kids. And, and some of the cookies were gone. And Pauline asked, where'd those cookies go? <laughs> was it you, Ken? No. And, and, and what did that little boy say? He said, they accidentally fell on his plate. <laughs> <laughs> but see, he got caught with his hand in a cookie jar. You know what I mean? But nobody taught him to do the wrong thing. It's just natural for all of us to do the wrong thing. You know? We're born with that. We inherited that from Adam and Eve, you know? We were born through those parents of ours, okay? So, and it's natural. They accidentally fell on my plate. I like that. And he was so cute, we gave him another cookie. <laughs> No, but you know what I mean. <clears throat> it, it, it's natural for us. So, you know, but the Bible says that we're all guilty. Every single one of us. So when Adam fell in the garden and God put that angel, okay, to guard them from the tree of life, now that they were in this sinful state, they were going to be in that state forever if they would have ate from that tree of life. Think about that. And you know, there's some people right now that are in that place. They never accepted Christ in their life, and there's gonna, they're already dead. They're still dead. They don't have Jesus in their life because they're going to accept what Jesus did. So when they pass from this life to the next, they're going to be eating from a tree that they'll be eternally condemned. See, Christ came to stop them from that. You know what I mean? But for us believers, we're going to have access to the tree of life. And there won't be any curse anymore. We're going to live forever, aren't we? So, you know, it's a good thing that the Lord did for us. You know, now look at this. Verse, I think I did, verse 14. Nevertheless... Death reigned, okay, I read that. So verse 15. Now we're going to look at some things that are a contrast, okay? Well, the free gift is not like the transgression, for by the transgression of the one, many died. So see, there's a gift for all of us, isn't there? there there's a gift that gives us life, and then there's a gift that keeps us in a bad state of condemnation, right? And, and the first one gave us a gift of being separated from God. That's what, the, that's what Adam did when he sinned. But look at this. You know, verse 15, 
But the free gift is not like the transgression. We already talked about that. See that word much more? Verse 15. Much more. This is what I wrote about that. It's far outweighs, out distance what Adam did. Isn't that amazing? He did a whole lot more for us. Jesus went the extra mile, didn't he? And grace of God, the gift of grace is given of the one man, Jesus Christ, to abound to the many. And really, that word many, if you were to look at that, it means all, okay? But not all, because some people will think, and I know there's even a, a group of people uh, that believe that, you know, the universalism, they think, okay, that Jesus died for everybody, and it doesn't matter how you live, you're all going to go to heaven, okay? That's what they think. But that's not the case, because in verse 17, it tells us it's only for those who receive that abundance, you know? So by faith, we get to accept what Jesus did for us. That's not a free gift for everybody. It's a gift for everybody if we accept Jesus by faith. You know what I mean? What he did on the cross. So that people that teach like that, they're not teaching properly. You know, they're teaching that all is going to go to heaven, it doesn't matter, you know. I've been to a lot of funerals, and a lot of people think everybody's in heaven. Isn't that true? But this is how we get to heaven, right here. It's through Jesus. That's how. You know, verse 16. So it's a free gift. So either way, we get a gift. I don't want the gift that Adam gave me. I want the gift that Jesus gives me. How about you? And you know what? That gift is we are justified by his blood, okay? Just as if we never sinned. That's what it means. He doesn't remember our sins anymore. He came to die for our sins. See, he became a man. That's why they call him the second Adam. He became a man and took our place on the cross. Now, that's pretty amazing to me. How about you? You know, verse 16. Let's look at another thing. Let's look at the effect that uh, Adam brought and the effect that Jesus brought, brings. And the gift is not like that which through one who sinned. For one, for on the one hand, the judgment arose from the transgression, resulting in condemnation. See that? That's what happened with Adam. Remember God saying in the garden after they fell from the tree, Adam, where are you? Where are you, Adam? And what did Adam do? He was behind the tree and he said, I'm over here, God. I'm over here. He was hiding behind the tree. He was behind the bushes. And God knew that he ate from that tree. Because before that, he didn't realize that he was naked. But now he did. And God knew. Oh, you're hiding. Because you can't be in my presence anymore. Because of sin. You know? And that's why God cast him out of the garden for a while. Because he said, you know what? I don't want man to be separated from me anymore. I'm going to send my son Jesus. And he's going to die so they can be restored in relationship with me. Isn't that awesome? But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. See, we're justified, right? He took on all the sin of the world on that cross. He loves us. See, a lot of people think that the Lord don't love us. 
He's judgmental, you know? He's bad, he's evil, he's this, right? He's going to judge us for everything. Not really. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. You know, that's why he came on this earth. So one of them, you know, the first Adam, he brought judgment on us. The curse, sin, those are, those are cause and effects that happen, right? But in verse 17, here's another contrast. For by the transgression of one, death reigned. Through the one, much more, much more. There's that word again. I like that. I like the fact that Jesus always does much better, right? Those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? You know, he, he, we pass from death to life when we accept Christ. And he gives us grace. And he makes us righteous. That's awesome. I don't know. There's some days that go by in my life I don't feel very righteous on my behavior sometimes. But Jesus makes me righteous. Praise the Lord. His blood makes me righteous. From that Adam. Yeah? That Adam. You know? And look at verse 18. And then through one, transgression resulted in condemnation to all men. And that's the thing. Like I said it before. All men, we all inherited that sin. And we're, we're living under the world of condemnation until we accept Christ. There's no way around it. We have that sin on us. You know what I mean? <laughs> we got that sin on us. And we, we got a, the only thing that can clean that is the blood of Jesus. That's it. It isn't uh, praying seven times to Mecca. Or, you know, going to church every Sunday. I hope you do, because if you love God, you will, right? But going to church isn't going to save us. It's the blood of Jesus that does, right? But everyone's under condemnation until we accept Christ. And because the other one, you know, his act of righteousness results in justification. And you know, his acts of righteousness. That's pretty powerful right there. And you know, I was talking about this match. One match causes the whole forest to go on fire, right? Well, guess what? Jesus put the whole forest out. Isn't that amazing? He put the fire out. That's amazing to me. That's a miracle. You want to talk about so much more? That's a whole lot more. <laughs> right? Isn't it? Isn't that amazing? Thank you, Jesus. And thank you that we're justified. And he gives us life. You know? You know? We walk around with condemnation until we accept Christ. And I honestly believe, you know, when we're born again, when we accept Christ in our life, and we, we ask him to forgive us our sins, and ask him uh, to cleanse us through repentance, he washes us in his blood. And when he does, that condemnation's gone. And, and you know what? Even angels 
know that. You know, they can tell the difference. As I remember, uh, before I was living in a world of condemnation and just learning to live to please my flesh and my sinful nature before I got saved, you know, the devil wasn't too concerned about me. He was already, he already had me, and he already knew I was already condemned, okay? So he wasn't too concerned. It's when I accepted Jesus in my life, that made the devil concerned. The next thing you know, there was spiritual warfare going on. You know, there was no spiritual warfare before because the devil already had me. But once I got saved, everything changed. And I'm sure it was the same with you, right? No more condemnation. Now we have life. Praise God for that. You know? And and then we're going to look at the difference now between obedience and disobedience. Okay? Verse 19. As though one man's disobedience, which that's Adam, right? And we know what he was disobedient. He ate from the fruit, didn't he? He didn't listen to God. He blamed his wife. <laughs> See? Don't look at me. My wife told me to do it. Right? And then, what, she, what did Eve say? Don't look at me. The devil made me do it. <laughs> Playing the blame game. Right? But you know, his do- disobedience, all of us were made sinners because of it. We can't argue that, okay? As much as people want to argue that, we can't. But even though the obedience of one, many were made righteous. You know, and and I I thought about that, and I, I thought about the obedience of one. How was he obedient? Well... Uh, You know, I want to look at a couple verses. It's in Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 8. It says, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on a cross. See, Jesus was obedient. Yeah? Yeah? And there's another place it tells us in Hebrews chapter 5, it tells us this. Verse 8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. He was obedient. And then there's another place he was obedient in the garden. And he said, not my will, but your will be done. See, he he fought with his flesh, and he submitted his will so that we could die. And isn't that interesting? Even that, when we're thinking about contrast, the garden is where man fell, and it was in the wilderness that Jesus got the victory. He got tested by the devil. He didn't give in like Adam and Eve. He fought them with the word of God, didn't he? He didn't give in to that temptation. And not only that, but he surrendered his will in the garden to die on the cross. Isn't that funny? Contrast of gardens. There was also, what was the other thing? They ate from the tree. Jesus died on a tree. Isn't that awesome? That's good to know. And, and you see that through the whole, the whole uh, gospel story that there's such a contrast between the two. What, how the devil stole it from us, Jesus took it back, you know? He took it back. We got stolen at the tree, well, he died on the tree. 
You know, they lost their life in the garden, but Jesus restored their life in the garden. Better. When you read in the book of Revelation, there'll be no more curse, no more pain, no more dying. Right? The curse will be no more. You know? And, and there's some people still living in the curse. So when we look at this, when we look at this contrast between disobedience and obedience, his obedience made us righteous. But then verse 20 and 21, you know, it says the law came that transgression might increase. So the more we know about sin, okay, the more we're going to realize, right, that, wow, we're all guilty, right? But where sin increased, grace abounded that much more. Isn't that awesome? Much more. That word much more again, right? Isn't it cool that Jesus went the extra mile? Praise the Lord. And not only that, but he... See, sin, verse 21, it says, sin, we, we're going to reign in death. That means we're going to be kings of death, right? But we're going to reign through righteousness because of the other man. We're going to be kings and priests in God's heavenly kingdom. So, some people still letting sin reign in their life, but you know what? Those of us that accepted Christ, we're going to reign with Jesus. And we're going to be right, we're considered righteous, whole, clean, and we're going to have eternal life. We cross from death to life. You know, there's two more places that, two more verses I want to look at. It's in 1 Corinthians 15. Then we're going to do communion. You know, 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about the resurrection. And, and it gives us a few things that compare Adam, the two Adams, again. So let, let's look at those comparisons. Paul talks about it here, too. This whole chapter is about the resurrection. The whole thing about Jesus resurrecting, how they are preaching about the resurrection, how they saw him in his res resurrected body, and what our bodies are going to look like. I love this chapter. You guys ever wonder how your body's going to look after we leave this earth? Some people say we're going to be in our 30s. I don't know. It doesn't really matter, but it's going to be awesome. You know, we're going to be in our prime of life. When we get our new body, and it's not going to get old, it's not going to get sick, right? And, and you know, th this chapter is amazing to me. And th the truth be known, the whole world is afraid of death. Do you know that? That's true. But for a believer, we don't have to be afraid of death. The sting of death is gone. And, and, you know, this chapter talks about that. This chapter is, to me, it's uplifting big time. But I want to look at a couple, in the middle of all that, he compares the two Adams. I want to look at verse 21. For since by a man came death, and by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. That's talking about the two Adams again. So one brings death, and the other one brings the resurrection of the dead, right? For as in Adam, we all die. See? We all die, because we inherited that sin. Also, in Christ, we shall be made alive. You know, because before that, we were all walking under condemnation, and we were dead in our sins, in our transgressions. 
But when we accepted Christ, he made us alive. And we got, you know, that inner man I preached about last week, right? It became alive. And Christ is the one that gives us life like that. He gives us resurrection power. And we can walk in victory here on this sin-cursed earth. Once we're born again, filled with the Holy Ghost and power, we can walk in victory. Doesn't matter, right? about the sin and the curse all around us. Christ makes us alive. Now we're going to look at verse 45. Same chapter. So also it is written, the first man Adam became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. See, remember God breathed into Adam and he came alive after he formed him with the, the dirt, right? But see, Jesus is the only one that can, a life-giving spirit, that's what it says, right? Jesus is the only one that has the power to breathe life into our dead soul. He's the only one. He breathes that resurrection power into us. We were once dead, but now we live. He's a life-giving spirit, see? He doesn't keep the life to himself. He gives us the life. That's why he came on this earth. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural then the spiritual. But we know Jesus existed before Adam, right? But what it's saying is here is when we're born, when we're born, we inherit Adam's sin. That's the natural, right? We breathe, we have life, but we're dead on the inside, right? Aren't we? But when we get saved, the spiritual will come. And we become born again. You know, that's a gift for everybody, but we have to accept that gift. It's just not going to happen because we show up at church. It's not going to happen because we're born in a family of believers, okay? It's not going to happen because I'm in a certain denomination or not. You know what I mean? Because there's a lot of people in that case. They're still under condemnation. We all have to make that choice and accept the gift that Jesus gave us. And we're here to celebrate that today. We're here to celebrate. Praise God for that. I praise God that God provided another tree. And the tree in the garden was in the end of it. How about you? I'm glad he did battle in the garden, too. And he said yes to our Heavenly Father so that his blood can wash us clean. Praise the Lord, right? You know, and, and I'm always intrigued when I look at this whole thing with Adam, the two Adams. And, and comparing the two. Because, boy, there's such a big difference between them. Such a big difference. And I'm going to summarize this right now with these things right here. The first Adam brought death, judgment, condemnation. That's the first Adam. Is that what I said? All right. Second Adam... This is what he brought. Life, a free gift, grace, justification, righteousness, and, and he, because of what he did, we're going to rule and reign with him. Isn't that awesome? 
Those are all things. So we're going to say thank you to Jesus this morning. That's what we're going to do. Can I have help with the communion? We're going to say thank you. Yeah, I have one already. You could just pass around. And, and I, I'm going to, I, I want to ask you right now, okay? If I'm going to ask everybody while they're passing communion out, because I want everyone to be able to have communion. And if you're here and you don't know Christ and you're living under the world of condemnation and you never accepted that gift that he gave you because we have to receive that by faith, okay? It's an opportunity for you to ask him to come in your heart right now. I'm giving you an opportunity. And if you're here and you never accepted Christ in your life, this is an opportunity. And, and I'm going to ask everybody to bow your head right now. I don't want anyone looking. And if there's anyone here right now that never accepted that gift and they're not sure if heaven is their home and they want to be they want to be in Christ a new creation if you're here, I'm going to ask you, just raise your hand. I'm going to say a prayer for you. I don't want anyone looking. Just raise your hand if you want me to pray for you. Is there anybody? All right, I saw that hand. And we're going to say a prayer. Now, I want to say a prayer before we do the communion. How's that? And I, I'm going to, I'm just going to ask, I'm going to say a prayer, and we're all going to pray this prayer together, okay? I don't want to single anyone out. And uh, we're going to pray. It doesn't hurt to pray it again, right? It's not like we're striking the rock twice here, like Moses did, right? Well, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I know you died on the cross for my sin. I'm asking you to cleanse me of my sin. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. And I'm asking you to come into my heart and give me life. Thank you, Jesus for saving me. Thank you for being that second Adam. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Amen. Amen. So now I want to... I'm going to read something out of 1 Corinthians as we prepare for communion. You know, Paul uh, wrote this yeah, hold on. Yeah, I'll put that there. Yeah, Paul wrote this. Since we're talking about what Paul had to say today, I think it's appropriate to do communion that way, through him, through his words. And verse 23 it says, for I receive from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night which he was betrayed, took bread. It's time for us to say thank you for all those things that the second Adam did for us right now. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Pauline, you want to pray for the bread? You got, you got communion? Yeah. 
Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to be a sacrifice for us, Lord, because of our sin, but yet he took that sin on his back as he went to the cross for us. We thank you that he was willing to sacrifice his body because of his love for us, Lord God. Yes, Lord. We thank you and praise you and help us to show you our gratitude each and every day of our lives, Lord God. And we just pray that you uh, bless the bread we're about to partake of in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake together. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In the same way, he took the cup. After supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant. In my blood, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And you know, we're going to, now that we're looking at this cup, this this juice that we have in our hand. And it's a reminder for the blood that Jesus shed for us. His blood justifies us. And he told us to keep remembering that. <coughs> There's no other way except for the blood of Jesus, right? It cleanses us of our sin. It puts the fire out. It puts the fire out, and it also it forgives us of our sin, and it also provides healing for our bodies as well. All the things the curse brought, the blood came to turn all that around for us. Isn't that amazing? The blood is the gift that Jesus gave us. It's a gift to heal our sin and anything else the curse would cause us to struggle with. You know, maybe somebody, you know, treating us wrong or a sickness, a disease, or maybe a besetting sin that keeps cropping up in our life, you know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? And Jesus did that for us. And, and when he left this earth, he left the blood behind for us because he knew we would need it. You know, when he went to heaven, he didn't go to heaven with any blood. He had flesh and bones. <laughs> He left the blood behind, and it's as fresh today as it was the day he shed it. And it's there for anyone who would ask. Praise the Lord, right? And I want to say a thank, thank you to the Lord. And I'm going to name those benefits one more time before we drink from the cup. He, this cup gives us life. This cup gives us a free gift. This cup gives us grace. This cup justifies us. This cup makes us righteous. This cup makes us sons and daughters of the king of kings. It's because of the cup. It's because of the blood. And we're going to say thank you to Jesus right now. Let's partake together. Oh, thank you for the cup, Lord. Thank you for the blood. I want to thank you that you're a life-giving spirit. I want to thank you that we cross from death to life. I want to thank you. I want to thank you that we will experience the curse no more. 
You said it was finished on the cross, Lord. The work is done. It's completed. And I pray, God, that what you established in heaven with the blood of Jesus will continue to be established on the earth. In our hearts, in our loved ones' hearts, and those that haven't accepted you yet, Father, in their hearts as well. Because you died for all, Jesus. And I want to thank you for your blood. Thank you, Lord. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Let's stand up. We're just going to worship the Lord one last song. Because I know presence I, I speak, speak Jesus. Jesus I just want to speak the, the name, name of Jesus, Jesus. till every, every dark addiction starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus, cause your name is power, your, your name is healing, healing. Your, your name, name is, is life, life. Break, break every, every stronghold, stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. I just want to speak, speak the, the name, name of Jesus, Jesus over fear and all anxiety, anxiety. To every soul held captive by depression, I, I speak, speak Jesus. Because your name is, is power, power, your, your name, name is healing. Your name is light. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Shout Jesus from the mountains. And Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus, your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Burn like a fire. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. 
Just do that chorus one more time. Cause your name is power. Your, your name, name is healing. Your name is life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. 